Welcome to this episode of Farming Matters, which is a uh, video featuring North Central Region SARE's Farmer Rancher Grant and uplifting the work that they've been doing on the ground. And, and um, we are really, really just very grateful to have both Gabby and Maria from Zumwalt Acres in Illinois, who are here to share about their Farmer Rancher Grant Project, investigating the ecological impact of pairing agroforestry establishment with biochar production. So thank you, Erin. Thank you, both of you, for having us. I'm Gavi. I'm one of the co-founders of Zumwalt Acres. Um, we started in 2020, and I've been involved since the beginning, working on lots of different facets of the project. And I'm Maria. Um, I joined Zumwalt Acres in the fall of 2021. Um, and I've been farming with CA since then. And more recently in the past year, I've been more involved in some of the carbon capture research that we do at Zumwalt Acres. So the project that we're sharing about today is investigating the impact of pairing agroforestry with biochar, which was um, supported by the North Central SARE. And we're really grateful for the funding that this um, that SARE provided that allowed us to pursue this really exciting project. Um, um, Zumwalt Acres is a regenerative agriculture community. We're located in, in Sheldon, Illinois, which is on the unceded homelands of Kickapoo, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Potawatomi, and Asethi Sakowin peoples. Um, our mission is to foster the next generation of farmers, scientists, activists working to build a better food system and tackle climate change. So that looks like farming about 20 acres of land, as well as hosting apprentices each season. And um, we have young people aged around 18 to 27 coming and joining us on a three month to six month or longer basis and learning about farming. People come in with all different skill sets and then learn about the different research that we do. Um, including this project, as well as expanding to carbon capture, other realms of horticulture and agroforestry. And we have a mix of organic vegetables, as well as hay and grains and trees in agroforestry systems. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on our agroforestry and biochar today. So to give a bit of an overview on our project, um, we really wanted to find a way to implement agroforestry, capture carbon, and utilize on-farm waste products. And this project achieved all three of those goals by utilizing wood waste that we had on site to make biochar, which is a special type of burning wood, essentially, so that the carbon that's in the wood is actually stored in a stable form rather than re-emitting um, when the tree decomposes and contributing to atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that carbon is then st stored in a stable form for um, hundreds of thousands of years, potentially. Um, so we used four different types of trees and shrubs, including apples, pears, persimmons, and hazelnuts, um, and planted both control and test trees, and then monitored tree health um, and tree growth over the first few years of establishment, um, and we'll continue to do so going forward. Um, another part of the project was um, implementing agroforestry. So the way that we planted some of our trees was in an alley cropping system, which means that we planted trees um, in rows and then between those rows were annual vegetables. So the trees are really small right now and aren't shading out any of the annual vegetables. There's plenty of space. Um, and so we, we saw really good results and were able to implement that in a few different ways, including with our pear trees and our persimmon trees and um, that had benefits of reducing the need to mow and weed around the trees because we were already tending to that land. Um, and once the trees are grown and um, start to shade out the region in you know, 10, 20 years, then we'll stop annual cropping or move to shade tolerant um, plants as the trees grow up. So in terms of biochar, we were using two different types of kilns, um, a Contiki open flame curtain kiln, and then on ROCC kiln, a rock kiln, which was developed by Dr. Paul Anderson, who's in Illinois. Um, and both of the kilns worked well. We basically just wanted to see what's, what's the most effective way to produce biochar from a labor perspective, and then also quality of biochar on a small scale um, on farm utilizing on-farm waste products. And so we used um, mostly 
for this project, we were using wood from ash trees that had died due to the emerald ash borer. Going forward, we'll be able to use like tree prunings and um, other waste products from our agroforestry establishment, all of the um, woody material that usually is either burned in big burn piles or just decomposes naturally. Um, we found that it does take a fair amount of manual labor to prepare the wood to produce the biochar and then actually produce the biochar. So that's an important note for farmers looking to implement biochar on site. Um, but it does create a really amazing product, as you can see on the right, that's a Contiki kiln. Um, and that's a biochar that we would ultimately mix along with um, <clears throat> manure or some sort of compost, um, maybe soil to sort of inoculate it, fill it up with all of the nutrients and microbes that we want to be living um, in our soil mix that we then apply to the tree. Um, we also sent in our biochar for analysis and saw like 80 to 90% carbon content in the biochar. So we're seeing good results in terms of carbon storage on a long term. Okay, thank you, Gabi, for that overview. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about the effects of the biochar on the trees, and we have some data and some charts and graphs to share with you all. Um, so overall, we saw similar or increased growth rates in our trees that were treated with biochar as compared to our trees without biochar. Um, and um, at the same time, though, we recognize that our study was um, still pretty small scale, um, and so we think that this is is a good area to research further into the effects of biochar application onto tree growth. Um, Gabby, can you go on to the next slide, please? Um, so this is a chart of our persimmon tree growth. Uh, these trees were planted in the fall of 2021, and they were measured um, throughout that fall, and then as well in the next growing season in the um, spring and summer and fall of 2022. Um, and in this chart, the trees highlighted in red are our experimental trees and the unhighlighted rows are um, our control trees. Um, and we saw pretty significant growth in persimmons planted with biochar as compared to those without. I think persimmons were the trees that we saw the, the highest difference in growth rates um, across our experimental um, four varieties. And um, and yeah, that was like really encouraging for us and exciting, exciting data. Gabby, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and then as compared to our apple trees, um, with apples, we didn't see a, a significant de or a significant difference in um, growth rates or like total growth. Um, and this chart here shows uh, the tree height over time. These trees were planted in the spring of 2021, and they were measured throughout the 2021 and 2022 growing seasons with the black trees, or the black lines indicating our control trees and the red lines indicating our the pretty similar growth rates, nothing too significant there. Yeah, so we just want to thank um, Central Sarah again for your support, and we're really excited to continue to monitor these trees as well as continue to establish more trees and produce more biochar and learn about the different ways that we can grow food in healthy and carbon negative ways. Thank you. Well, that was um, I was I'm struck by a lot of things and like what what would be like your ratio ratio to biochar to other things in in your mix when you establish these trees. Um, we we aimed for 85% biochar and 15% manure to activate the biochar, um, and then we would then mix that in with soil um, for our planting. We started off by adding the soil at the beginning, like when we were start first inoculating, and then we noticed that because the soil would have like weeds, seeds mm -hmm. in it, it was better to not <laughs> and um, mix it in when we're actually planting. And were you top dressing that? It was actually like in the in the hole before oh, cool. the trees went in. And then, um, yeah, for these trees, uh, that was the case for all of it. For some other trees, we've also used it as a top dressing. And how are your trees doing now? So, I mean, it's been in, well, what, a year later, really, but oh. <laughs> um, overall, they've done pretty well. I think uh, a high percentage of our trees made it to um, the first spring after their first year of planting. Um, so we we're really happy about that. Um, 
we have we have had a few losses, but I think overall they they're doing pretty well. Are you experimenting kind of with the fencing thing because everything loves fruit trees in this climate? In 2021, when we were planting all of these trees, we um, put tree tubes, white plastic tree tubes, around all of our saplings to protect them from deer and other things. Um, and then as they started to get older. Um, and the tree tubes were also supposed to help them grow up straight and tall and also not have branches for their first, like, five-ish feet of um, the trunk. Um, but as they got older, we found that the the tree tubes would also get really hot in the summer. Um, and so they, they weren't ideal for, like, all weather conditions. And so now we are trying to implement better fencing for deer protection. Are there any plants that don't do well in the alley cropping system because of the biochar? Mm -hmm. We haven't found that. We've used biochar with most of our horticultural establishments as well. Um, doesn't seem to like impact the pH substantially or really, um, yeah, have, an, ha have any negative impacts when, if it's like applied at a reasonable um, application rate. Like on those lines, are there other like other tips you would offer to other growers who would want to start on a similar path or I think uh we definitely recommend the alley cropping system, um, especially because we have um uh, an over 1,000 tree agroforestry system on our farm. Um having a lot of trees is a lot of land to manage and um keeping the land around it weeded and mowed and irrigated. Um, is a big undertaking and for our alley crop trees like Gabi said before because there was horticulture production happening around them that wasn't um, that was one less thing on our to-do list and that was really great um, and uh, another suggestion is uh, uh, being prepared for the the manual labor of biochar production it does take um, a lot of time and effort and um, in the fall of 2020, the, the crew that was here then um, really created a lot of biochar and they spent a lot of that season burning biochar and that was a big help for our planting in the spring, in the following spring of 2021. Is there anything that is in your heart that you want to share with our listeners and viewers out there now that it would just feel incomplete if you hadn't, hadn't done it in this time together? I think one thing I would add is um, like in selecting our trees, we, we worked a lot with the Savannah Institute. They were super supportive of all of our agroforestry establishment. Um, and thinking about native um, plants were, was really important to us um, in selecting our, our tree crops and sort of balancing that with like what's marketable and what's like lab the labor of like harvesting and what people actually want to be eating and all of those sorts of considerations. Um, that I think that there's so many exciting um, native Illinois fruits that are so underrated um, and reincorporating them into our local food system, I think is really important and exciting and like ultimately makes um, the farming easier in many ways because they're well suited to thrive in our area and you don't have to go through hoops to accommodate um, the needs uh, that of plants that are not actually as suited for our climate. Um, in terms of um, marketing specifically and kind of that end of it like if we're going to plant all of these amazing fruit trees um what are we going to do with all of the product like what happens what well, are we thinking no, just kidding. <laughs> in a good way um i think the good thing about planting saplings is that we have probably at least seven years to start hyping people up to <laughs> do the different um fruits and nuts that we're growing um, and I also think that, um, uh, yeah, I think people, people seem to like food and people seem to like, um, uh, to try different things that they haven't been able to try before and just, um, tapping into those networks of who's interested in exploring different types of food and who is interested in cooking these things and how can we, how can we get these into smaller markets, um, in, in, the Chicago area or like in the mid Illinois area um, is an exciting journey to embark down.